narrative summary of verses 1 through 6, at least that much. Now, it could push its way back up into chapter 5, uh, starting with about verse 11 and coming down to verse 14. But at least, I believe, what the writer is doing is he is establishing, for lack of a word, lack of, lack of better words, an applicational principle here. He wants his readers to do something. And it's almost like he, he's saying what he's saying three times. Because I think he has the impression they're not getting it. And a lot of times when you repeat yourself, you probably do it because those you're talking to are not getting it. It's kind of like when you were a child. And mama took you up to the trash, and you acted like you couldn't hear. But the next time she told you, uh, she said it a little bit louder, uh, with a little bit more emphasis. And then you still didn't empty the trash, so she says, I'm going to tell dad on you. And so now all he had to do was do this. <laughs> and that communicated. <laughs> Or he was like this one mother. You remember she bought this piece of wood. And she had it carved into a paddle. And she had it, uh, you know, printed into the paddle, the Board of Education. <laughs> and uh, whenever she reached for it, that communicated. But usually she wouldn't have to reach for it until after she told you three or four times. Now, this is, to me, kind of what the writer to the book of Hebrews. Because, you know, uh, if you're familiar with the book of Hebrews, it has what we call some warning passages in there. Five times the, the, the Hebrew Christians are warned uh, about a particular issue. But let's take a look at verses 6 and 7. Now, verses 6 and 7 says, For the earth which drinks in the rain, that comes oft upon it and brings forth herbs and meat for them by whom it is dressed, receives blessings from God. But, by way of contrast, that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. Now again, those two verses are an illustration. And all of you speech experts know that uh, illustrations are used for uh, one or two purposes. Uh, usually when you explain something to someone and you kind of get the impression that they don't understand it, tell them a little story. And that story is designed to explain what you were saying previously or show you how to do it. Now, I think that he wants these people just simply to do one thing. It comes out in verse number one of chapter six. Look at verse number one. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us grow up and be mature people. That's all he's trying to say. Probably starting at chapter 5, verse 11, and maybe going down at least to, chapter, to verse 10 of chapter 6. Let's grow up. Now I take it in, if, 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 if verses 7 and 8 can push its way back up to chapter 5, he may be saying this. Here's one way to grow up. Move from infancy to adulthood. Uh, in chapter 6, verse <coughs> 26, I think this comes a little bit more home to us. Move away from academics and raw wooden Bible study to personal, practical implication of what you're doing. That's spiritual. 
when you get to the place where you can do what you know, you mature. But when you don't do what you know, then I believe you fall in line with verse number eight. Now, the third one, he's going to go from positive to negative. Those two, he went from negative to positive. Move away from infancy to adulthood, away from academics to personal practice. Here he says in verse 7 and 8, particularly verse 7, move to spiritual productivity, verse 8, and away from spiritual or, lack of a better word, carnality. Move to spiritual productivity and away from uh, spiritual inactivity or producing things like thorns and briars. Now, uh, I think that if we were going to sum it up or say in capsule form, the, the, uh, uh, the whole uh, message of the writer of Hebrews in capsule form, it would go something like this. You are growing in spiritual maturity when there is God-generated spiritual productivity in your life. You are growing in spiritual maturity when there is God-generated productivity in your life. Uh, so he's talking about the simple thing of growing in spiritual maturity. Now we know that uh, according to verse number four, you know, this is this is probably the problematic passage in this section. Especially this word impossible. Now if you're the kind of person who believe that you can lose your salvation, this is a very troubling passage for you. Because he uses the word impossible. Now, if you interpret the words uh, uh, in verse, uh, let's see which one it is. Verse 6. If they shall fall away, it is impossible to renew them to repentance for us. So if we start with verse 4, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, ellipses, if they should fall away to renew them again to the repentance. Okay, now this word impossible. Um, it's the word adunatos in Greek. It's a, uh, it's a negative part of It means, you know, it's kind of like uh, being amor. Doesn't have any morals. It's kind of like being amillennial. You know, people who believe that there's going to be no millennium that prefix ah. This is a dunatos. That, that alpha on the beginning of the word is a, is a negative prefix. It means you can't do this. It means it's impossible for this to happen. If you interpret this falling away as losing salvation, if you lose it, you can forget ever getting it back again. It doesn't say it's nearly impossible. It means it's completely impossible. Now, this word impossible could be used both figuratively and literally. But in both cases, it's a no-no. It's like a double whammy. It says, no, you can't do it, whether you use it figuratively or, or literally. It means no. It means, it means something that simply cannot be done. It's not possible. It's unable to be done. So, you know, it's problematic if you, if you lost your salvation and you believe that this is saying you can't get it, hey, what you going to do? If you're only 20 years old, you got 80 more years to live, and you can't be saved again because it's impossible for you to get it back. So I think you need to do a bit, little bit more digging to find out whether or not this is what that's really saying. I don't think that's what he's saying because I believe that it's very easy to make the case with salvation that once you get it, you got it forever, and you cannot lose it. And I think he's going to touch on that a little bit, but that's not his main point. His main point is here is that you all know the background of the book of Hebrews. You know, these Jewish Hebrew Christians 
were under persecution and they were thinking about going back to Judaism. And he said, ah, please don't go back to your BC days. It is worth it to hang out with Jesus than it is to go back under the Old Testament law. So now, if he's driving us back to chapter 5, I think that we could probably have a, a, a better understanding of what's going on. Uh, he's probably saying in chapter 5, verses 11 to 14, and we won't read it for lack of, because of time, but I think that basically what he is saying here is, uh, you just cannot stay a baby all your life long. Now just think about this. Suppose you had a son or a daughter who's 40 years old insisting on sleeping in the baby crib. Now he's not sick. He just wants to sleep in this baby crib. He doesn't want any steaks and potatoes. He doesn't want any burgers and fries. He wants a milk bottle. He's 40 years old. And he also insists that you change his diapers. Mm. Now, what would you do with a son or daughter like that? What would you do? Well, I, yeah, I guess you've got a lot of options. But the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying, hey, you need to get up because... You cannot possibly stay an infant all your life. you got to grow up and get beyond that. So now he likens it to, you know, uh, drinking milk. He says, stop drinking milk. And I think that what he means by this in uh, verse 12, he says, so For the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And have become such as have need of milk and not strong drink. Of course, you know, infants also need to be taught. Uh, you, 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 you ought to be able to teach by now. But you still have some money, need for somebody to teach you. But he says, I think, I think this milk drinking here probably is a metaphor for living without taking any growth measures. There's a lot of things you can do to grow up uh, rather than stagnating on a milk bottle and sucking on a milk bottle. You, should, you shouldn't be... Anybody in here still doing that? I, I hope not. He says you need to start eating some meat. And then why do you think God gave you those teeth? So you can bite that bird. So you got these sharp, clean, strong teeth. But you don't want to use them. Now I think in the spiritual context, it's like it's doing what you're all doing now. Going to Brooks. And I think that it's a beautiful thing. I think you made the best decision that you can make in your life when you decide to come to this school. I think you made a better decision to come here than to go to Omsal. Now, you know, Sloop is a Christian school, is that right? And I think you made a better decision to come here than to go to Sloop. I think that if you want biblical academics, you're in the best place St. Louis has. And I know that we have Covenant Seminary, and I know we have Concordia Seminary. But I believe that you can get Bible here like you can't get it at those places. You are in the best place. And so you are academically progressing in your academic career. But I know that it is the president's wish, the dean's wish, the registrar's wish, that as you progress 
academically that there be a commensurate spiritual progression along the way. That you don't only get the academics, but you get to the place where you're able to translate those academics into practical living. And that's six, one to six. Move from academics to personal application. Now, in verse number one of chapter six, he says, leaving the first principles. And I think that that shoots us back up. Uh, to verse 12 where he talks about the first principles of the oracles of God but here he mentions a couple of things uh, uh, laying the foundation of repentance again from dead works and faith towards God the doctrine of baptisms etc 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 now this leaving here I guess it's kind of like Genesis chapter 2 where you know when people get married they're supposed to leave their mother and father I mean you don't leave and leave them, right? You, you move out the house. Oh. And uh, uh, you, you start making your own money. Oh. <laughs> Preparing your own food. Uh, paying your own bills. Now you leave mama's house. But you're not finished with her. You're not through with her, she's still there. Uh, it's the same way with biblical doctrine. He's not saying forget about repentance and don't bother about it anymore. Forget about baptism and don't bother. Forget about the resurrection, don't bother about it anymore. But I think he's saying there comes a time when you need to learn how to make application of these things that you know theoretically so that they'll benefit you and they just won't be facts in your head mm -hmm. but there'll be spiritual dynamics and principles in your heart that drives your living and your lifestyle so move from academics to personal practice have a commensurate spiritual progress that is in keeping with your academic progress you know it's possible To make application from what you learn in every class you take here, every class, bar none, every class is designed to impact ultimately your behavior and not only cause facts to reside in your head. You can move from academics. To practical application, uh, which is the admonition of the writer. <laughs> so you need to do this. You really need to do this because there's consequences for not doing it. He says in 7 and 8 of uh, 6, two kinds of soil. Now here in verse number 7, the earth is the believer, the rain is metaphorical for the word which feeds the believer. The herbs, we could take it as productivity from the believer's life as a result of having the rain fall on it. Uh, the farmer here is God or the Spirit of God. And the blessing is the spiritual productivity. So we can see that you can, you can have a pagan farmer right next door to a Christian farmer, and they could be both producing. But one of the things that makes the difference is the acknowledgement and the credit that is given to God in the life of the Christian farmer. In other words, these are Christian bananas. <laughs> these are Christian watermelons. I, I believe God did this. What is pagan? It's not, uh, who, who is God? Where does he live? I've never seen him. What's his phone number? Can I call him? Well, a Christian doesn't need to answer those questions because we know, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that people try to show, show Christians up anyway. We know that everybody who asks questions don't want an answer anyway. But here is this Christian. 
he is compared, he's producing for now he's compared to another Christian in verse 8 who's doing nothing. And this person in verse 8, he's actually making the former angry. He's making him so angry, he wants to deal with him so he can be used again. You don't want to kill him. Just, just rile him up a little bit. And maybe he might produce something. I think that's the idea behind uh, verse number 8 there. Um, in verse number 7, he says, this is the, this is the uh, God-generated spiritual productivity, verse 7. The earth which drinks in the rain that comes upon it often, and brings forth herbs fit or meat for them by whom it is dressed uh, is blessed of the Lord. This is a picture. Now this is the summary of everything that's going before. Now he, he did two metaphors here. He did the baby adult one. He was just trying to say the same thing from babyhood to adulthood. That's all. Now he said, okay, I'm going to liken you like the earth. Okay? Um, are you supposed to bring forth apples? Where are the apples? Are you supposed to bring forth oranges? Where are the oranges? I mean, what kind of seed was planted in you? Well, why aren't we seeing anything? Now, how many, we have any farmers in here? Anybody ever seen a farmer burn up some ground? You know, what are they doing? Why, why do they do that? Yeah. To make that soil usable again. He doesn't destroy it and take it out. Now I believe this is sometimes why some believers go through difficulty. Mm -hmm. It's because they're not producing what the Lord has called them to produce. Mm -hmm. And the Lord wants to make them useful for how he wired them up. If the Lord wired you up to preach, I think you ought to preach. If the Lord wired you up to teach, I kind of think you ought to teach. You don't need to be an elder if you don't know how to make decisions and run the show. Just preach and teach. If you are mercy sure, you don't need to be going around being mean to people. <laughs> yeah, if, if, if God wired you up with the gift of faith so that you can trust him, you don't need to walk around doubting everything that's going on. You need to use the spiritual gifts that God has given to you to produce what can be produced as a result of how you're wired up. Now, if you don't, I think that verse 7 is describing uh, the experience you will have. Now, I don't think that the word in verse 7 where it talks about uh, he is nigh unto cursing and the end is to be burned. I don't think there's any hell there. There's nothing talked about here in life after that. This is, this is a passage that talks about Christians. Not non-Christians. This is just 